Lovely to be with you this morning. My name is Brian Harper, and I'm delighted to uh, spend this time of worship with you. For our scripture reading, I'm going to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, and reading the first 10 verses. 1 John chapter 3, and verses 1 through 10. And John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. May the Lord be pleased to bless to us this portion of his word this morning. Shortly after I became a Christian, my mother presented me with a new Bible. And I I wrote my name inside it. And along with my name, I wrote the words, Son of God. God. And after writing those words, I felt terribly convicted. What arrogance, I thought. What audacity. What overbearing pride. And you know, every time I I, I opened that that copy of of Scripture, I, I, I felt ashamed of my actions. Who was Brian Harper to say that he was the son of God? But then one day I was reading 1 John again, but this time in a different version from my regular King James. And I came across these words. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, And such we are. And such we are. How amazing. How astounding. There was no need for me to feel ashamed. For here was the depth of the Father's love. 
that we who trust in him, we who hope in him, we are now children of God. So that salvation, salvation is much more than simply the forgiveness of sin. Salvation is more than freedom from bondage. Salvation is more than following the right path. It's more than fulfillment of some service. Salvation is being a member of God's family. So that to be a child of God is the very pinnacle of salvation. For the great object of the work of the triune God in salvation, the great goal of Golgotha, that which we were thinking about in Good Friday, the great end of the empty tomb that we were thinking about last week, is the Lord's own glory through the adoption of children into his family. And so I want you to consider with me this morning, first of all, that sonship, being a child of God, in other words, is a fact that confronts us. While we speak of justification by faith alone as a fundamental doctrine of the church. Sonship, or being a child of God, is not simply to be regarded as a fruit of justification or a part of justification. For, and let me encourage you to use your imagination at the moment, while we rejoice in the fact of a, a judge acquitting us, declaring us righteous because of the imputed righteousness of another, and so setting us free from, from condemnation, we must also in our minds, I see that same judge come down from his bench, go to the court secretary's desk, fill out all the appropriate adoption papers, and then take us from that court with his arm around us and convey us safely home to his home as his dearly loved child and granting to us all the benefits of that home and all the inheritance that goes with it. It is not just justification. It's what that opens up to. The glory, the grandeur, the grace of becoming a child of God. For sonship is an unmistakable truth recorded in God's revelation. You have it here in 1 John chapter 3. You get it when Paul writes to Ephesians chapter 1 where he outlines the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, listen to these words. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us, now listen, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. The great goal, the great end, is sonship. 
And of course, this is part of Paul's argument that you get in Galatians chapter 3 and 4. You get it in Romans chapter 8. Get it in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. That sonship is, is an element of the whole, the whole sweep of salvation, be it election, be it redemption, be it glorification. It, it is the, the richest metaphor, the richest relational picture that you find in the Scripture regarding our salvation. As I said, it's more than simply forgiveness. It's becoming a member of God's family. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that sonship is presented in the Old Testament as a model of redemption. When you look at the Exodus, that great event in the history of God's people, What's the truth that comes out? What's the picture that is painted? What are the terms that are employed? Let's listen to the words of Exodus chapter 4 and verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. The ancient people of God pictured and portrayed as what? The sons of God. And then you go to the wilderness. And how was Israel described there? Deuteronomy 1 and verse 31. In the wilderness, you have seen how the Lord your God cared for you as a man cares for his son. And then you go from the patriarchs to the times of the prophets, and you hear the voice of the heart of God, the words through Jeremiah, Ephraim, my dear son, my heart yearns for him. Redemption in the Old Testament is presented in terms of sonship. And therefore, it's not a surprise to consider that sonship is what awaits our glorious restoration. For as you look back to the Old Testament, you see God dealing with his people as sons. In the present time, we are now the children of God. What's the situation in the future? Well, again, I simply go back to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And notice how wonderful it is that it will be as sons that we shall see the Son. It will be as God's dear children that we will see His dear Son. We shall see Him as He is, and we shall be like Him. How we thank God for every blessing bestowed upon us. But let me put to you again this morning that sonship is the pinnacle of salvation. That adoption as his dearly loved children is the apex of our relationship with God. But the question therefore has to be asked, upon what foundation is that relationship fixed? And so the second thing I put to you this morning is this, that in considering sonship and looking at sonship, the foundation that encourages us and comforts us, the foundation that comforts us. Look at John's exclamation here in 1 John 3, 1. 
See what kind. The older rendition. Oh, what manner of love. Upon what is sonship founded? And the simple answer is, it is founded upon the love of the Father. That we who are the children of God are the fruit of our heavenly Father's love. And what is the nature of this love that, that, that astounds John? Because you see, to put it plainly, to put it simply, uh, John, when he comes to write this, when he comes to pen this, he, he's, he's absolutely bewildered. He's astonished. He's, he's, he's asking, he's, you know, where does this kind of love, this love that the Father has shown, where does it come from? What country does this love come from? It's, it's foreign to us. It's, it's new to us. Uh, we, we've never seen the likes of this before. What kind of love? And we respond to John's questions by answering what, what kind of love? It's, it's the love of God the Father. Now, as many of you, I'm sure, know this morning, there are various words for love in the Greek language. That word eros, which is basically centered on the heart, philio, that's centered upon the mind, and then that word agape, which directs us to the will. The will to care, moving attention with affection, to action. It's essentially the willing response to someone in need. Not a response to some person's attractiveness. No, even a response because of something we might get out of it. But to pay attention to a need, to be affected so tenderly, that we rise to take action in order to meet or to minister to that need. Let me try and illustrate it this way. Uh, imagine uh, that we're not at a Sunday morning worship service this morning, but we've come to witness a marriage. A marriage ceremony, if you will. And what does the officiating minister ask? the groom concerning the bride. Does he say to him about her, do you like her? Do you like her? Um, what do you hope to gain from this relationship with this woman? What do you, what do you hope to get from her? No, of course not. What do we hear? Will you love her? Will you comfort her? Will you honor and keep her? And all the congregation witnesses are sitting quietly as you are, waiting to hear those wonderful words. I will. I will. I will. Oh yes, surely there is affection and there is attraction. But marriage requires that agape kind of love. Attention to, affection for, an action. Selfless, sacrificial action to benefit the other person. So how does the Father love us? Well, let me quote those old words. For God so loved the world. You. Me. A world of sinful men and women. That's who he loves. It doesn't mean that he likes the world. It doesn't mean that he finds attraction in the world. But what it means is that he paid attention to it and was moved by it and took action for it. 
and that he spared not his son, but gave him up for us all. That God showed his kind of love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, so unattractive, so marred and marked by depravity, but nevertheless, helpless and hopeless, in seeing us, he came and Christ died for us, because Christ came into the world to save sinners. What manner of love is the foundation for our status as the children of God? Listen to the words of the old hymn. So near, so very near to God, I cannot nearer be. For in the person of the Son, I am as near as he, so dear, so very dear to God, more dear I cannot be. The love wherewith he loves the Son, such is his love for me. Do you realize that this morning, my friend? Are you resting in that this morning? Are you rejoicing in that this morning? That here is the, the pinnacle of salvation. The, the privilege of being a child of God. A position we find ourselves in because God has lavished and continues to lavish His, his out of this world kind of love upon us. Here, here is this, this love wherewith he has loved us. The love that, that simply will not let us go. I, I love the way Dale Ralph Davies uh, 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 describes the love of God, that, that Old Testament professor. He says uh, it's... it's God's love is love with super glue on it. It sticks to you. It sticks to you. You can't get away from it. It's a stupendous love. It's a manifestation of God's grace. It's a sustaining love because it will take the likes of us all the way home to glory. It's a sheltering love. For we find ourselves under the shadow of the Almighty. It's a sufficient love. For the love of God is an unending abundance, a forever fountain from which we are constantly blessed. We are loved by one whose love is unending and unchanging and unmerited and unexpected because he loves he loves the likes of you, and he loves the likes of me. What manner of love is that? How assuring that our status, our relationship with God, does not rest on our love for him. Because our love is a fickle love, it's a fluctuating love, it's a fainting love, it's a feeble love. A love that's prone to wander. You know, sometimes I'm in the congregation and we're singing a, 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 a hymn to God that speaks about how we love God and I feel so ashamed because my love for God doesn't measure up to the love that the hymn writer had. And we do that, don't we? We sing these words so frequently. And yet we don't measure up. But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And the apostle's certain conclusion and joyful conviction is 
nothing, nothing in this world or the next, nothing can separate us from the, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That we look to him, that we rest on him, that we hope on him, we're being kept by him, we're glued to him. Such is his love for us. Sonship, the fact that confronts us, the foundation that comforts us, and thus thirdly, the fruit that confirms us. Sonship, seen by the fruit that confirms. Behold, exclaims John, here's something to see, here's something to be amazed by. And so how do we show, how, how do we manifest that we are the children of God? Well, I would put to you, first of all, by our very submission to the word of God. Because surely, surely that is where it all begins. This is where it comes into time and space. It comes to you and to me. I'm thinking about the words of John, but this time John's gospel. John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let me take you back to the wedding ceremony, okay? The ceremony's not over yet, folks. We're still at the marriage. So now I have to ask the bride. Will you have this man to be your wedded husband? To love, honor, and obey him. And again, everybody waits for the, I will. I will. That's the picture here, my friends. This is the picture here in these verses. The Father is saying to us, will you have this man, my son? Will you have this man to be your Savior and your Lord? Will you trust yourself to him? Will you take him? Will you receive him? Will you believe in him? For if you will take this man, he grants to you the right and the privilege and the authority to be a child of God. And I wonder whether you've ever done that. You see, I'm a visitor here this morning. I don't know most of you. I know one or two of you as I see your faces this morning. But I wonder if there's ever been a time in your spiritual journey when you have said, yes, I will. I will, I will have this man to guide and guard and protect me. I will have this man to love me and to keep me. I will have this man and I will by his grace seek to walk with him and obey him. A time when you have bowed your knee to King Jesus and said, I will. Coming to him coming to him just as you are, a sinner to a gracious and glorious Savior. Sonship is confirmed by our continual belief in and submission to the Word of God. But in addition to that, the fruit that confirms that we are the children of God is evidenced by our passion for the glory of God. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 17. The arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of man humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. 
Bogatsky, an old uh, Polish commentator who has a, a, a wonderful uh, daily devotional that I'm not sure whether it's still around. I know you can get it on Kindle, but he comments on that verse speaking to himself and he, he asks himself certain questions. Listen to them. He says, has this precious promise ever been fulfilled in your experience, O my soul? Is the will of God my rule? Is the righteousness of Christ my hope? Is the language of my heart and life that God be exalted in me and by me? Because without this, he says, my profession is vain. My faith is also vain. And I am still in my sin. What was he saying? He's saying that the evidence of sonship is a passion to see the Lord alone being exalted. And wasn't that the passion of John? He must increase. I must decrease. Was it not the very passion of the Son of Man from heaven? Father, I have glorified your name. I have glorified your name. What fruit confirms our son sonship? That we are indeed the children of God. Our submission to the word of God. Our passion for the glory of God. And so finally, our demonstration of the very character of God. And I'm going back to 1 John chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? him. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Can I put it to you as simply as I can? We have been called to be the children of God and thus to be channels of blessing one to the other demonstrating God's love, employing God's love, being motivated by God's love, being molded by God's love, leaving behind our desires for selfish praise and acclamation and admiration, but simply, silently, yet significantly serving one another. Being just like Jesus to each other, paying attention to one another, having affection for one another, and taking action when we see another in need. Ian Murray, in his biography of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, tells that in May of 1980, within the last year of Dr. Lloyd-Jones's life, he was speaking at a, a conference where his friend Paul Cook was pastor. And at that time, Paul Cook was undergoing a time of severe oppression of spirit. And his wife, Faith, naturally shared the heavy load and trial at that time with her husband. So during an afternoon break at the conference, Dr. Lloyd-Jones went to the manse to visit Faith Cook. He discussed Paul's condition with her. And then she said at tea time, he went on in prayer for about five minutes, praying for us and other friends. And Faith Cook summarized that the best part of his visit 
occurred when Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was leaving. No one had to tell them that, given Lloyd-Jones's condition, that they would they'd probably never see one another on earth again. And so Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones simply grasped her hand warmly and said to her, Remember the love of God. Remember the love of God. And Faith Cook's comment was, These words, perhaps more than any other, carried me through all the distresses of the months that followed. And so, my dear friends, Whatever the bleakness, however the blackness that you have to face when you go home from worship today or what you have to confront tomorrow, may I say to you, remember the love of God. Remember the love of God. Remember with astonishment and wonder and amazement, with faith and with hope, the love that has been lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And this morning, my dear brother and sister in Christ, such we are. Such we are. Let us pray together. Oh, may this bounteous, loving God, through all your life be near you, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer you, and keep you in his grace, and guide you when perplexed, and free you from all ills in this world and the next, to the praise of his glorious grace. Amen. Amen.